now for the shop report with What up, sports fans? Welcome to the Shop Report. I'm Barbershop J. I'll be your host for the day. Here's what's happening. We are at the end of the 2016 NBA season, and the finals, yet again, is once upon us. So here's our final analysis. Cavs versus Warriors. A rematch we all know, of course, from last season. And... Unfortunately for Cavs fans, the Warriors came out the victor. But lo and behold, once again, the Cavs get a chance to redeem themselves. And the question is, can they? Well, to most Cavs fans, not only can they, but they will redeem themselves to the tune of a 4-2 or a 4-1 series win over this Golden State Warrior team. Which I say... If you are at all, any moment of your life, a realist, that's ludicrous. Is there anything wrong with wanting the Cavs to win? No. If you're a Cavs fan, of course not. Even if you had to Google it, Cleveland's sports misery is well documented. But at no point... Should your fandom cause you to be dismissive to reality? Why do I say that? Because there's some discussion or there's been some comment about the Warriors and what they've been able to do up to this point. Going all the way back to rec- last season and winning the title, last regular season and then winning the title and then winning 73 games this season. I mean, hey, let's be real now. That's what we're supposed to be, right? That's what we say we are, keeping 100. The Thunder should have won this series or the series versus Golden State for a lot of reasons, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now that the Warriors are here, to not give them their just due, again, it's ludicrous. It's been said they ain't played nobody. They ain't ran into nobody. They uh, they this, they that. Okay. Well, if I'm not mistaken, the Cavs play in the same league that the Warriors play in that they ain't played nobody. Now, if you want to say the Warriors were one of them foreign teams like Tel Aviv or something like that and the Cavs were in the NBA and the Tel Aviv winner plays uh, the NBA winner in the finals, then I could understand the 4-1 or the 4-2. Because as much as I can't stand it, Today's game, or the Today BA, or the NBJA, National Basketball Jump Shot Association, the International League cannot compete, and we've seen that, of course, in the Olympics with the NBA. So if the Warriors were over there and the Cavs were over here and then they come together, yeah, I'd give you that. But the Warriors play in the NBA too. I guarantee you at some point in time this past season and in any past season for the last six, seven, eight, nine seasons, the Warriors and the Cavs both played the Pistons, the Raptors, the Spurs, the Thunder, the Blazers, the Hawks. But again, let us be real. How can you fix your mouth to say or say you're watching the same game and think that the Raptors or the Hawks or the Pistons are equivalent to or just as worthy of being formidable as is the Spurs, the Blazers, or the Thunder. Did the Thunder have brain lock moments and money moments of the series versus the Warriors? Yes, and ultimately it cost them. But if we're to give credit for what the Cavs did, for instance, in going 10-0 and to start this playoffs or this postseason, then how don't you give Golden State credit for being the defending champions and winning 73 games? Again, when they both play in the same league, you can't be selective and objective and 100 and real all at the same time. 
It's worse than wearing your shoes on the wrong feet. And you call yourself grown. I should have known. So here are some of our key moments to the series. Not keys to victory per se, but just things we want to point out, especially for those analytic folk who I'm going to always mention, who like to use numbers to say that that tells or paints the entire picture, and it does not. These are some things we're just going to throw out there and let you all digest, dissect, redirect on a prediction for what you think or who you think the outcome may favor. The Cavs, who we're starting with, seeing how we, again, broadcast from Chuck Hole City, on the season are 26th in the league from two-point range in total points per game output. For comparison's sake, Golden State is 17th. Now, before I go on, I'm gonna, let me throw this out here. There are a lot of people who are using the Warriors' regular season record against the Cavs as a barometer or an indicator as to how this series will play out. And that's if you're Golden State's fans or whatnot. Yes, the Warriors were 2-0 and against the Cavs this season. And we all know that January 9th, 8th, whatever game it was, when it was, you know, astronomical in terms of the score. But the regular season record for the Warriors carries no weight or little weight, if any, in terms of the outcome of the finals. In 1987 or 88, I don't know the exact year, the Cleveland Cavaliers were 6-0 and in the regular season against Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls the year Jordan hit the shot. So your regular season really has nothing to do in terms of record against or versus the outcome or how you'll be or do in the postseason. Now, what does translate are those elements or components of the two or three matchups or the two or three regular season matchups of two of both teams. For instance, like rebounding, defense, steals, turnovers, things of that nature. And we'll get into that a little bit more too. Those are things, again, that you could say in this finals, yeah, well, hey, those are keys to winning a finals or a series or a championship. If you lose one, I guarantee that is a stat that's accurate. You can point to those things, plus or minus for whomever or whichever team, and usually it correlates to whether or not the team won or lost. But let me ask this question. Are the Cavs tough enough? You know, it's been said that despite a guy's ability and so on and so forth, experience is a key element as well so each level you go to in a postseason the pressure intensifies increases so now that you're at the finals the question must be asked on the Cavs side of things can Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love handle the moment Because there is some question, again, are the Cavs tough enough? Will that moment be too big for Love and Irving? We shall see. On the Warrior side of things, Draymond Green. One more flagrant or two more technicals results in a one-game suspension. And we all know he is a key element to what the Warriors do, whatever it is that the Warriors do. But we all know. Draymond Green is a key. How much of a key? That's for you to determine. More so than Clay or Steph, that's also for you to determine. But integral, Draymond Green, that he is. If he gets a flagrant two, it results in a two-game suspension. 
So now the question becomes, do the Cavs try to get in his head? Will he be able to maintain his composure? We shall see. And we all know at this juncture of a postseason, matchups are important. Now, I'm not going to give you the whole gambit of both teams, rosters, and compare this guy to that guy per se. But I will say this. On the Warriors side of things, we all know that Steph and Clay love to come off them screens, them curl-ins, whether they at the three or if they see space to get deeper into the paint near, the, near and around the foul line, they pull up for them jump shots. Well, if you think about the Thunder, strictly in terms of stature, for them guys to be hitting them shots, despite them being the Splash Brothers, the degree of difficulty made the shot m- makes – that much more impressive. Because every time Steph or Clay came off one of them curls, they had Ibaka, Durant, Adams, Kantner, Roberson in their face. They are not going to face the same testament. I like that word. It might not apply or might be applicable to some of y'all, but it fits here, I think. When they coming off them curls or screens and they dealing with a Kyrie, or a JR, or Iman Shumpert. So shooting over the top, quote-unquote, won't be as challenging for the Splash Brothers. Iguodala, we all know, had last year's finals MVP. Impossibly. It's no way in the world with the game's best player on the planet, on the floor. And a basic six-man, bench man, wins the MVP, man. I'm just saying. Is Kerr going to start out with that? Matchup? We shall see. Defense, as I mentioned, is also a key. The Warriors get steals on 7.3% of their defensive plays, more importantly on the perimeter. The Cavs get 6.4%. Like the Villanova Wildcats in the NCAA this past season, the key element to Villanova winning this past season NCAA championship over a vaunted North Carolina, at least by college basketball standards, team. Villanova's perimeter ball pressure negated North Carolina's interior play. How? The further out I extend you on the floor as a pass post entry player it's more difficult for you if I increase the distance for you to get that pass in the post because that's what North Carolina was most known for their interior play and nowadays even at the collegiate level post entry pass is not being taught it used to be a standard because it is an art which again befuddles me when I watched Kevin Durant roll the ball to Steven Adams on the floor. Guys don't know how to do it. For all this, these cats with this athletic ability and all this talent, the simple stuff is mind-boggling to them. When you play defense out on the perimeter, it allows for your front line or the guys behind you to be in the positions necessary or beforehand when a dribble drive from the opposition is on its way back there as opposed to the Swiss cheese, open the door, swing and gate, sieve type Ds from Kyrie. 
He puts the shot blockers in a precarious position. Yeah, it is a word, precarious. Look it up. Thus, increasing the foul trouble percentages. Because if you give up on the perimeter defensively too soon, really you shouldn't at all, but if you give up too soon, you, 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 you put your shot blockers in a chase position or getting, le- getting over there late position, which leads to foul trouble. So when we discuss, again, this matchup thing, Let's look at it from a production standpoint, offensively. The Warriors' front line, for the most part, not only do they have a multitude of bodies to throw at you, but they can score. Score in ways or in terms of flow. Offensive flow. Tempo. You know, when we see a team play offensively, really on both ends of the floor, and the execution seems, I won't say flawless, but it's, it's, it's crisp, it's concise, it's almost like music. In one regard, you got a guy with, with a drum machine and a beat machine, and the music sounds good. Then on the other hand, you got a guy or a group that's a band and they playing actual instruments. The sound seems natural, pure. Then you got the Philharmonic symphony. Top of the line. When you see a team playing as a symphony, especially on offense, things usually turn out well. More importantly, on the defensive side. You cannot give up your defensive principles so quick that it puts everybody else in the defensive rotation at a disadvantage. Can the Cavs score the three ball as they have or as well as they have This entire postseason against the Golden State is possible. They were second in the league. Ain't no denying that. These dudes played 82 games. And were second in the league. But then again, the Warriors were first. So in terms of the three ball, the two really wash each other out. So, where are your advantages if you're the Cavs, if you're the Warriors? The depth for the Warriors is key. Channing Fry for the Cavs is also key. But he, too, falter in the big moment? We shall see. Rebounds are crucial to winning or losing a series. And in this case, the finals. The Warriors were fourth. Fourth. In terms of league rank and rebounding. The Cavs were ninth. So, do those two numbers, do they, how, how much do they weigh, if anything? What about points allowed per game? Golden State was sixth in the league, and the Cavs were tenth. See, these are the things I'm saying, or I'm talking about in terms of the Warriors were 2-0 and against the Cavs in the regular season. Again, that don't mean nothing. But rebounding steals, turnovers per possession, turnovers per game. Well, those things 
over an 82 game season or postseason before you get to a finals or the finals portion of a postseason tend to lend itself more towards tendencies than than what the record was against that team or this team or that or versus so to speak see that stuff carries more weight the Cavs were 27th in the league in steals per Golden State was ninth. So that tells me, or should I say, I got to ask, based on which number, who's playing better D and where's the D being played at on the floor? Remember, Nasser, 24-second shot clock. 24-second shot clock. How about turnovers per possession? The Cavs ranked 10th, Golden State 18th. Now, that's a number where if you watch the Warriors, real talk, they actually look like a turnover waiting to happen, not just about on every possession, but more often than they should based on their style of play and what, they've, what they were able to accomplish so far. But turnovers per possession – Again, I'm asking y'all, where do these numbers fit in? And how are they connected, if at all, to a Cavs fan's prediction of the Cavs winning 4-1 or 4-2? And then how about this? Turnovers per game, the Cavs were sixth. Golden State, 23rd. Again, you wouldn't know that watching them play. You'd be like, man, how is that possible? But, hey, what, what do the numbers say? What do the numbers say? How much do they weigh? Which is why I've always said they have a place, but give me style of play. That in and of itself is more substantial than a statistic. And that is largely the reason why a team will or won't win a finals. Don't be so quick to dismiss the Golden State Warriors. I think that is crass. Even if you have a dog in the fight, I think that is beyond crass to be so dismissive towards what they've done. And they've done it against the same folk that the Cavs who are being lauded for have done. If you want to say, man, I want my team to win, but it's going to be a good one or whatever. Okay, be, be general in nature. But be honest. Don't allow your want for it to cloud or be dismissive to reality. Got to take the emotion out of it. Because in the end, on paper at least, the Cavs have just as good a chance of winning this finals as do the Warriors. But 4-1, now I see why some of y'all want to go to Mars. Because y'all been practicing. The key to the Cavs winning this series is not the three. It's defense, making sure your rotations are tight, funneling guys, trapping, hedging in the corners, And on offense, inside, then out. You don't have to, and I'm not putting the onus on LeBron. That's whomever it is. You have to have a back to the basket, if nothing else, just to show it so that it draws a double team. And wherever that double team comes from is where the ball should go to. And then you have a defense doing what they should do if your ball movement is true. 
and that's chasing you. For the Warriors, all they need to do is keep doing what they do. If you all went and looked at some of them shots, and I'm I'm not a fan of the three-pointer just for the sake of. I'm not. I still say easy baskets, high percentage shots, will win more games than they lose. But I get it. It's the, it's, it's the today BA. That's what they do. So if you look at, by NBA standards, the shots that Clay and Steph were hitting in the closeout game against the Thunder, which, again, they shouldn't even have a chance for, you dealing with Kevin Durant at 6'11", and then his wingspan at seven foot nine. That's unbelievable. But on the flip side, you see the Cavs on their way to 500 threes, 499 of them made. You don't see no Hawk, no Raptor, no Piston even in the picture. Now, I'm not blaming them for that. They did what you're supposed to do, knock it down. But I all I ask is in this finals, Will those shots be contested? And how many of them shots in the moment can you make if they are contested? Because if you can overcome this challenge, because that's what this is and will be a challenge. If you can overcome that in this series, congratulations. Have your parade. Just don't set none on fire. Well, y'all, it's been fun, but we got to run. We appreciate y'all for listening to the Shop Report. Y'all can check us out on Facebook and Twitter at the Shop Report or shoot us an email, theshopreport365 at gmail.com. And remember, the next time you want to know what's really going on, come to the shop. Walk-ins are always welcome. I'm Barbershop Jay. Holla. Thank <laughs> you.